would you like to live in Smyrna? How would you like your address to end in Smyrna? No, I prefer Fort Lauderdale. Good morning, from the laundry room. I am the lord of the laundry room. My name is Martin Zender. I make sense, I make sense for a living five days a week. I make sense seven days a week. You just don't know it on the weekends. People who know me and love me realize it. They see me making sense all the time. I had an interesting statistic that I wanted to uh, share with you, but I forgot yesterday, and that is that I gave away uh, over 150 books at the conference. I am able to do that because of your generosity, not to mention the generosity of Charles Rutsch, who sent uh, four cartons of First Idiot in Heaven books from California at his own expense. He probably doesn't like me trumpeting that fact, nevertheless. Um, thank him and honor him for that and because of that the books got distributed people took home books and they're going to distribute them i told you the people at the holiday Inn express were consuming uh my books at an alarming rate this guy ken from minnesota kept coming in having me sign books running out taking them to the staff at the holiday inn express so that was that's good that's good this is a great opportunity now the snatching away didn't happen okay we're potentially disappointed of course we all yeah we should be disappointed we want to be with our lord we're tired of this eon rightly so however now that we're forced to live another day in this horrible wicked eon full of darkness um we might as well get books out apparently the window is still open for paul's evangel and so we're going to strike. Yeah, I'm going to take advantage of the days and we're going to strike. Going to put new books out there and distribute old ones. But the old ones are new ones. The great thing about the truth is that it does not get old. It's uh, the same every day. It hasn't changed since Paul wrote the original manuscripts. So it uh, yeah never becomes obsolete. Get those books out there. I'm showing you a different view on the um, laundry cam. I changed the cam. I'm using my onboard computer at a jaunty angle. I hope you're entertained. I need to mix it up a little bit. Now, we're going through the Ecclesias that will be in Turkey, the ones John wrote to. He's writing a letter which contains seven letters. Did you get that? He's writing a letter, a letter to, uh, to the Jews, to us, really. But within this letter that we call Revelation, there are seven letters to seven different groups of people who are going to be perched on the edge of trial. They're going to be going through the tribulation. Jesus himself, in some form or another, will be walking among them, reading this letter, not blowing their minds, not turning them into bright green glowing orbs, but educating them, not delivering them from trial, but taking them through the trial now here's what the spirit has to say to the ecclesia which will be at smyrna now where's the city is there a um i'm gonna look at this again smyrna what's the modern name of smyrna according to this allaboutarchaeology.org the persecuted church Smyrna that suffered poverty and martyrdom. Smyrna was located north of Ephesus in a powerful trading position on the Aegean Sea known for its harbors, commerce, and marketplaces. The primary ruins of Smyrna are located in the modern Turkish city of Izmir. So if you are in Izmir today, if you are listening to my voice from Izmir, that means that you are standing in the ancient, at the ancient site of Smyrna. That means that you are standing at the future site of a conclave or an enclave, some kind of clave consisting of expatriated Jews, either obvious or sublime or subliminal Jews, and they will be being prepared for three and a half years to enter the tribulation. Now, let's read about Smyrna in the word of god itself then i'm going to go back to dr bollinger and give you his comments on this ecclesia <clears throat> i'm still sounding a little bit like a frog i'm still a bit groggy i don't know what's going on except that i'm catching up on sleep from the 
Indianapolis Conference. I'm in Revelation 2, verse 8. And to the messenger of the ecclesia in Smyrna, right? And remember, to the messenger. The messenger is a human being. A messenger can be a celestial being, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so. It simply means messenger. It is the Greek word angelos. King James translates it angel in some places. And when it's obviously talking about a human being, I suppose they translate it messenger, but the concordant just translates it messenger and lets you figure it out by the context. Well, every ecclesia in Israel had a specific messenger, a specific representative of that ecclesia. And so that's what we're looking at here. To the messenger of the ecclesia in Smyrna write, now this he is saying, who is the first and the last who became dead and lives. I am aware of your acts and affliction and poverty, but you are rich. Oh, I can't stop there. I can't, I can't qu keep reading. I have to comment on that. I'm aware of your acts, your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. This is the way God looks at things. If you are suffused with the word of God, if you know his will, if you know his, pur his purpose, if you yourself are perched on the edge of Aeonian glory, then you are rich. Richness and capital in this life. Paul says, devoutness with contentment is great capital. He says that in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Listen to this. Devoutness with contentment is great capital. Does the world measure capital that way? No. They measure capital by how much money you have in the bank, how many stocks you own, how much property you have. But God measures capital, at least Paul does there, by um, contentment contentment and here capital is being measured by the fact that you are part of these seven ecclesias in jewish terms these people have won the lottery now we would say what kind of lottery is that you're perched and ready to go into the tribulation we don't want to win that lottery but to them they're on the front lines of the kingdom and they're going to be going through it and they're happy with their allotment well our allotment is among the celestials we are not appointed to indignation so how rich are we i've told you many times you have won the lottery how rich are we that we are poised to inherit an allotment among the celestials also known as aeonian life it's aeonian life is a broader term we have an allotment among the celestials now we're getting specific you see so, I'm aware of your acts and affliction and poverty, but you are rich. And the calumny of those saying that they themselves are Jews, but they are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. These people are making fun of you. They're calling themselves to be Jews, but they're not. They're the synagogue of, of Satan. And yet these people in this context have been vexing the inhabitants of Smyrna. They're coming out of some persecution. And birds of a feather flock together this particular ecclesia this particular group of people this out called uh, these out called refugees they have been particularly vexed by people who say that they're of the synagogue of god they say they're jews but they're not they're not jews because they don't believe god they don't believe christ I am thinking probably the reason is because they have jumped onto the bandwagon of the Antichrist. Many, many Jews in this day will jump on the bandwagon of the Antichrist because they are politically oriented and they're money oriented. They love capital with dollar bill signs on it, dollar signs on it. You know, all those guys, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, U.S. Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah, Andrew Jackson, they love these guys because they're printed on the money. That's what they go for, and that's what they're going to go for. And Christianity is not immune to this, obviously. With Christianity, it's not so much um, these U.S. presidents, and Ben Franklin wasn't a president. He's on the $100 bill, but... Um, it's not only the money that they like, but they like the prestige, they like the power, they like the influence. This is to be hated. This is to be hated by people of God. And those who do hate it will be in conflict with those who embrace it. And those who embrace it, those who embrace the money and the power, they will persecute 
to the end, they will persecute those who see past this and embrace the true God in Christ. Because those who embrace the true God in Christ, if you intend to live devoutly in this life, Paul says, you will suffer persecution. And living devoutly in this life does not simply mean you do good things, your behavior is great. It can mean that, but it also means devoutly, I believe devout is to revere, to well re revere. It means that you esteem God and Christ. And by doing that, you will embrace teachings that tell the truth about God and Christ, not the lies. You will have unhanded the doctrine of free will. You will have discarded the doctrine of eternal torment. You will have jettisoned the sick teaching of the Trinity, which denies Jesus' very words that I came from God, the Father is greater than I. Colony. Colony is um, it's like uh, insults. They're insulting you. They're saying bad things about you. They're calling you names. They call us names. They think we're apostates. They think we're of the synagogue of Satan because we're not going to church. You need a head. You need to have authority over you. Uh, you need accountability. How about this for accountability? Jesus Christ is our head. Jesus Christ is the head of the body. We give an account to one, and that's him. And these refugees in these camps, these are good camps, not bad camps, not like FEMA camps. Yes, these refugees, they have Jesus Christ himself walking among them. But I wouldn't be surprised if, like in the movie Field of Dreams, where some people could see the players on the field, some people couldn't, those who are say they're Jews but are of the synagogue of Satan, they probably won't even be able to see Jesus Christ walking among the ecclesias. Where did all these players come from? Yeah. How's that for accountability? I'm accountable to Christ. Christ is my head. You telling me I need a human head? The people who claim this, look at the human heads they have. Look at the people in authority or who have power over them. They're leading them into false teachings. They're leading them into the apostasy. They're leading them into the cult of Christianity and the cult of false Judaism. They're saying that they themselves are Jews and they are not but are the synagogue, a synagogue of Satan. What a twist on words. Can you believe this? This is bold. Synagogue of Satan. John is taking a sacred word, a synagogue, and he's saying you're a synagogue of Satan. This is like Paul calling the circumcision the maim -cision. It's a play on words. He's taking circumcision which means to cut around circum is around scission is to cut circumcision means to cut around he's taking that and he's saying no you take such pride in a in an act of the flesh that i'm going to make up a term for it that's really satire at its finest and i'm going to call you the maim scission you're not cutting around it you're just maiming it you're just injuring it it's nothing more than something you need to go to the hospital and treat it's something you need to take antiseptic for or antibiotics. He's killing them with that. Killing them. I love it. Love the satire. He's making fun of them. Just like Elijah did with the prophets of Baal. Where's your God? Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's gone on a long trip. Why don't you yell louder? And they did. They're stupid, man. Synagogue of Satan. You can't imagine the... Really, I want you to understand the shock of that satire. My version uh, about a, a, a Christian church, you know, would be that, um, like, uh, well, the Church of Satan, you know, they have the Church of uh, God, the Assemblies of God, I call it the Assemblies of the Devil or something like that. Um, the Catholic Church, the Satanic Church, Church of, hang on. Sorry, I forgot to turn my phone up there. So. Yeah, I definitely put a twist on that stuff, and I do. Synagogue of Satan. Man, this letter to Smyrna. If I was a Jew, I'd want to be in Smyrna. 
I, you know what? Who cares if it's Smyrna? Who cares what it sounds like? Fear nothing that you are about to be suffering. I can't not comment on every single sentence of this letter that the Spirit is giving to a future Ecclesia in Smyrna. Fear nothing of what you are about to be suffering. Sounds like this advice is coming from somebody who knows the end game, who knows the outcome. Because look at this, you're poised. Oh my gosh, look. Like, if this is the advice given by the Spirit of God to someone who's about to go to the tribulation, fear nothing. What's coming? 90 pound hailstones, 200 million supernatural cavalry who are going to be cavalry who are going to be coming out of the earth to assassinate, kill a third of humanity, the sun being darkened, all the horrors of the bowls. The messenger is saying to these people in Smyrna, fear not. Don't be afraid of 90 pound hailstones. Don't be afraid of five months worth of supernatural locusts. Don't be afraid of the sun being darkened. Don't be afraid of the rivers turning to blood. Don't be afraid of one third of life on earth dying. Don't be afraid of an earthquake that knocks down every city on the earth. Fear not. Let me read this again. It's just a misprint. Fear nothing that you are about to be suffering. I might be on this letter to Smyrna for a week. I don't know. I have not, I've read this many times, but now that I've taken the time to go into it, it's blowing my mind. This is why. If these Jews, these Israelites, members of the house of Judah and the lost tribes of the house of Israel, if these are being told to fear nothing, and they're about to go through the tribulation. What am I to say about us who are not even appointed to go through the tribulation? Some of us are even afraid of rising to be in the air, to rise into the air to meet Christ because it's the unknown. We just don't know. We're a little afraid of it, Martin. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> We're afraid of being on the brink of being rescued out of the coming into nation when these Jews are being told to fear nothing on the brink of going into the tribulation? You see what I mean? What a contrast. If they're not supposed to fear, how much more are we supposed to put our fears behind us? And I admit, you saw me record a show in the middle of the night before that hurricane was coming through. Irma who was not a nice lady and it filled me with foreboding and the adversary was simply using the hurricane as a, you know, just as a representative, <clears throat> excuse me, of all the other evils in the world. And I realized once again, the potential that Satan has to just shred all of us, shred our faith, shred our lives. But God stands with us. If you think it's a great thing to have Christ walking among these seven lampstands, these seven groups of outcalled Israelites, if you think that's great, wow, who could be closer to Christ? Think about it. We're closer to Christ. We have the Spirit of God, not only Christ, we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. That's closer than to have Jesus Christ wandering around among us. We have the Spirit of God that makes its home in us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I think. Maybe it's chapter 3. Read all of 1 Corinthians, you'll find it. The Spirit of God makes its home in you. We are well placed at the edge of Eon 4, at the consummation of Millennium 6. And any, there's no place for fear for us. If there's no place for fear for the Smyrnians, then there's no place for fear for us. 
Maybe I'll get one more sentence here before I wrap it up, although I'm at the edge. Speaking of being at the edge, I'm at the edge of my time. Fear nothing that you're about to be suffering. Lo, the adversary is about to be casting some of you. Oh, well, this is this is this is bad. I don't like this. I don't want to end. I don't want to end on a sour note. <clears throat> but you know where I'm gonna face everything. You know I do. That's what I do. I'm gonna face it. I'm gonna come back here tomorrow and face it. No problem. Uh, the the centerpiece here is fear nothing. Um, the centerpiece here is your acts and afflictions and poverty cannot alter the fact that you're rich. That's a one crazy mind bender. That a people that appear to be to the unenlightened eye afflicted and poor are actually very rich. And then there's the insult. The insult. The selfish barbs. The hurtful insults that come from people who are saying that they're Jews, but they're of the synagogue of Satan. We suffer the same thing today of those who say they're Christians, those who say they love God, say they love Christ, but no, they are of the church of Satan. They're of the church of Satan. They belong to Satan, not to Christ, because they do not embrace one correct teaching about God or Christ. They believe the lie. They believe in eternal torment. They believe in free will. They believe in the Trinity. They're of the, they themselves are of the synagogue of Satan. And yet some of us are intimidated by them. What? You're intimidated by people who are of the synagogue of Satan. But Martin, they look so nice and they look so... Yeah, I know, Ayers, that that's the deception. Satan has packaged the deception in a fine little sweet tasting pill. Otherwise known as he disguises himself as a messenger of light but he's not. And he's going to tempt us to be afraid. He's going to tempt us by using people who claim to be in authority and they look like they're in authority and they're rich. They're not afflicted. They're not sick. And we're going to be tempted to be swayed by the opinion of those who are not going through what we're going through. Think of Jesus on the cross. There's the Pharisees. There's those finely scented, well-dressed men of religion taunting our Lord while he is on the cross, taunting him. Oh, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Can you believe it? I wouldn't want to be those guys at the great white throne. No. We are vessels of honor, not dishonor. You can thank God for that. We have won the lottery. We are the richest people on the planet, and we're soon going to cash in our policy.